welcome to everyone to our um, session eight, um, the quantified self representation and mediatisation. Um, what we're going to do is do the three talks um, successively and then have uh, questions at the end. Um, and our first person is Rachel from Kent from King's College in London, and her talk is about social media and self tracking representing the health self. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to jump straight in um, because of time. So today I'm going to be talking um, about one of my methodologies from my PhD research, um, which broadly looks at how people use social media to represent their health through a variety of different ways. Um, and some of the questions that I'm asking kind of more broadly is um, how and why users of self-tracking devices and applications share and actually represent their health through social media. How these self-representations enable ways of experiencing and viewing one's body and health in relation to others, and does the acquisition and sharing of this data mean better health outcomes or optimization? So this, the title of this paper today is the findings from just one of my methodologies, which is just the interview data, um, but I'll go into a little bit more detail on the other methodologies in a moment. So, this research is part of a um, European Research Council funded project called Ego Media, which is based at King's College, and it's looking at the impact of new media on forms and practices of self-presentation. So this is kind of where my research is being situated. Um, so just to provide a bit more context on my overall methodology, I'm not going to be discussing all of this today, but I've conducted two short interviews, um, guided reflexive diaries for, from my participants, um, and they provide screenshots of their data, and then they provide a reflexive diary on the days that they share this content. Um, and I've got 12 participants who were um, volunteering from a call for participants online. Um, I've got seven women and five men aged from 23 to 49 years of age. Um, these participants aren't um, using one specific device or one specific health application, but they're all sharing certain health-related data through Facebook and Instagram. So these are the kind of converged main platforms that I'm actually analysing and looking at. Um, and they're sharing in lots of different ways. So this is including statistics, data and screenshots from the self-tracking applications themselves. But I'm also really interested in on the kind of qualitative ways that we can represent health and the qualitative aspects of self-tracking. So selfies, fitness, exercise, food photography, um, often with data from the applications overlaid. So my participants aren't people dealing with, um, they're lay people, they're not people dealing with a certain disease but they're people who are training for marathons, the everyday lay person, um, as well as patients as well, but I'm not focusing on, on one type of user um, or person that's training towards particular goals. Um, if you're interested in this further, um, I have a forthcoming chapter in a book that Tihaj has edited called Self-Tracking, um, Perical and Philosophical Investigations. And um, I've also done two uh, films for an exhibition at Somerset House, um, for an exhibition called Dear Diary, which I'm going to start the presentation with today, provide a bit of context, because um, then I can shut up for a bit and you can watch something visual after lunch while everyone's digesting, um, to provide a bit of context about self-tracking within social media platforms rather than just looking at the apps themselves. People carry in their pockets every day devices which track their whereabouts, their location, the steps they take, the stairs they climb, and this may be knowingly or unknowingly. There's a rise of users called self-trackers or self-quantifiers who use wearable devices, so wearable digital health te technological devices, as well as platforms and applications within phones like Nike Plus or Strava to track and monitor certain health practices. <coughs> Now, a lot of the ideas around these devices is that self-knowledge through data will improve health. So we will have increased knowledge about our bodies <coughs> through optimising and improving our health. This idea that better health means improvement, continual improvement. And so users um, of these different devices can not only use this acquisition of data and self-knowledge for themselves, they can then obviously share these um, 
share these um, practices, share the data on social media. And from the sharing practice, they practice, they get feedback from the community, and this encourages further self-tracking and further self-monitoring and arguably Im improved health. Um, and it draws the, the community's gaze into, into what they're doing every day. It's quite a self-motivating tool. I'm going to be doing a 10K run in June, so I shared something to keep me accountable for it, and I got really great feedback from people. I think if you keep it inside, then if you don't do it, then you've only got yourself that you've let down, and you can kind of ignore it. But if you tell somebody, then it kind of puts it out into the world, and other people are going to ask you, and you kind of have to have an answer. Okay. So I hope that provided a bit of context on the kind of work that I'm doing, the data I'm collecting and, and the types of participants that I'm working with. But I think there, I don't, you know, I don't need to provide more context on self-tracking. That's been covered in you know, many of the brilliant papers that we've heard already. Um, but in relation to um, that exhibition, we're looking at how self-tracking and health diarising can be uh, another way of understanding our body through writing publicly about health or sharing um, life logging data. Um, as a different form of diary. Um, the perhaps more qualitative aspects, but also the quantitative aspects of, of logging and tracking your whereabouts and your health and your behaviours. In the context of social media, what I'm looking at is how we represent ourselves on social media using these different devices. So historically, representations were made by a set of people, so curators or filmmakers. But with social media, we're creator and subject. And this othering of oneself, this differentiation of one body type and another is a dominant discourse within biopolitics, which is what Tihaj talks about extensively in her work, but also within the competitive and the comparative strategies enabled by social media platforms. And it's these functions and affordabilities that I'm interested in and the convergence with these different self-tracking technologies. They enable these representations of certain health lifestyles and a performance of what I'm calling this health self. So I'm going to be working through the empirical data, the findings from that, in these three themes, so self-tracking and self-surveillance, self-tracking and peer surveillance, and then constructing the idealised healthy self. So to begin with self-surveillance, we now understand online through these conceptualisations of the digital self as being represented through practices of consumption, which is often equated with participation. And I'm looking at consumption as not only what we put in our physical bodies, so food or drink intake, but also what we share online through self-representational tools. And so we understand, as we've touched on a lot in the last few days, that um, in neoliberal societies, consumption is reflexive and it's equated with participation. And then there's a collapse that's occurred between the metaphorical and the physical consumer. So health is no longer about being in good or poor health. Health has become representative of lifestyle choices and an involvement to make the right consumption position the citizen as a consumer to actively make the right ethical decisions for the management of individual self-care. And this is a key discourse um, that's come up in the last few days and is advocated through social media platforms as well as the tracking devices themselves. So through these participant interviews, the research findings identified that this commitment to self-management was often manifested as a personal responsibility, associated with positive feelings towards healthy actions, so exercising or eating healthy food, or in terms of negative associations with unhealthy traits, so consuming junk food. And the guilt attached to these unhealthy habits was often internalised by these users, and that was often in anticipation of the perceived judgement from the community. But that was then contrasted with the relief as well from the successful management of health, and that being conflicted with the guilt of mismanagement. So this discourse of self-surveillance and individual health, there's a core pressure to be active, and to perform these healthy behaviours and, and optimise health. You see all these people being healthy, and you think that you need to be healthy as well. It's also kind of like a guilt trip. You feel like you're missing out on the stage of improvement that they're getting. I think I could always improve my health. There's nobody on social media really promoting a good, balanced life. It's a world of extremes, it seems. So as demonstrated by Austin's case here, it's perceived as a responsible process to be active consumer, an active consumer of health. And so the discourses surrounding the ineffective implementation of self-surveillance and the moral implications that arise from these internalised pressures, we can understand as different forms of self-policing. So this intensified practice of self and peer surveillance, but that which actually directs on how people 
um, manage their health and their, their subsequent behaviours to, to modify their behaviours um, and change their health practices. So morality and health and body image becomes inextricably linked to these practices of self-tracking and the data-driven constructions of the health self. But what's key about this is that in Austin's case, it may actually never actually manifest into action at all, but it can become a, become a, a form of personal judgment. And this reinforces this responsabilizing discourse that regardless of individual parameters, regardless of what we can actually physically do ourselves, that the body can um, be optimized like a machine. There could always be something more we can learn about ourselves. So on to my second theme, which is self-tracking and peer surveillance. And so demonstrating health knowledge and management and improvement through the sharing of data is a key way for these participants to represent their health self. And as demonstrated in that quote from that short clip, you can see how the voyeuristic gaze of others serves as a very motivating tool. And this ensures that others watching, they turn their gaze from others watching, they, the participants turn their gaze inwards. They adapt and uh, um, shape their exercise routines based upon the community's gaze. The motivating role of accountability is key once content shared, and the accountability is towards the community as well as towards oneself. And even if other self-trackers, physiques, or exercise regimes are unattainable, it still encourages and drives people to keep self-tracking. So this connection of community and understanding of others doing similar things provides a comfort and is a supporting tool in this um, motivating discourse of, of health betterment. It encourages me to be healthier the more I post. So Sophie, and more of Sophie later, she was um, a, fa a fascinating participant. She and many of the other participants recognise that the more they track, the more they share, the more they reflect, that genuinely makes them feel healthier. So this process of reflexivity is a motivating and guiding tool in itself. And regardless of whether what they're actually sharing is, uh, is true, so the representations of what they're putting online, what the, the most important thing about these representations is it contributes to their internal dialogue, it contributes to how they feel as healthy or unhealthy beings. So constructions of this health self are in consideration and through careful inclusion to certain health information. And for many of these participants, attempts at truth-telling were delivered in consideration to community norms, so avoiding oversharing, um, but also avoiding coming across like you're obsessive about a healthy lifestyle. So many of them would post cheat meals or unhealthy behaviours, which were often not their own but their friends, within their photo streams or on Facebook or Instagram to prove, to show that they were authentic, that they didn't have an obsessive healthy lifestyle, to put it in their terms. So this careful representation of the authentic health self is constructed, but obviously, ironically, in appearance of authenticity for the gaze of others, but obviously ends up arguably creating a very inauthentic representation of self. So the data becomes the significant tangible evidence for user self-betterment. We've heard this already this week, and this has a weight over personal gratification and self-achievement. Um, this then, as I've mentioned, this, this adapts and moulds how people then respond to that feedback and then changes their lifestyle. So similarly, this consciousness of observation from others within the community for concealment of unhealthy practices is key. So as Jenny outlines here. You can kind of see the frequency of people's posts. If they normally post food photos and they haven't for a while, then it's probably because they're eating rubbish. So as Jenny says, posting is expected from other regular sharers, and if it's not performed, it's indicative of unhealthy behaviours, rather than, say, somebody not having time or doing something else. So this is interpreted as a lack of commitment from the self-tracker, as well as not being in line with discourses of self-regulation and discipline to in, in achieve these individual improvements. So this governance of the soul, to use Nicholas Rose's terms, ensures that this judgmental discourse attached to being inactive, so lazy, encourages individuals to undertake self-surveying practices, prioritise self-management, to undertake more healthy behaviours. So the lifestyleization of health becomes a parameter for being active or inactive, healthy or unhealthy, good or bad, um, through the practice of sharing and the feedback from, um, from the community. So the relationship between health and lifestyle becomes ever more entwined within these data sharing cultures. Um, so on to my last theme. So these representations often ensure that the physicality of the body is hidden 
and the data becomes representative of the physical body. But depending on how users actually share certain aspects of the hidden body is also key, because that is what constructs this idealised body and healthy being. For example, Sophie plans dinners around what she thinks is aesthetically pleasing on Instagram. I do think when I'm cooking dinner, like, ooh, that would be a good Instagram picture. So I think, what can I cook that will look good for Instagram later? In the end, I just spend so much time moving things around on the plate that by the time I get to eat it, it's cold. <laughs> Poor Sophie. Um, so the aesthetics of food become integral to what ha individuals share online, but what they put in their bodies. So the unattractive representations, they don't make the final public edit. Diets and the body are tailored to the desired aesthetics of what's visually pleasing on social media, what goes in their bodies and what they share. So this commitment to sharing and uh, tracking becomes also a, both a conscious but also an unconscious desire. I was like a disciple and I still am. It's in my psyche now. I went through two months where I did no exercise but it kept me in that kind of mindset and there was always a slight influence of health so what I think is really fascinating about this is that the focus on healthiness or healthism dominates the user's everyday lives. And if, even if they're not able to maintain healthy behaviours, the users, the people that have self-tracked in the past, they genuinely identify with being a healthy person due to past self-tracking and representational behaviours. And that's often current, uh, regardless of their current behaviour. The health self is very much embodied by these self-trackers and is often a very utopian, idealised representation of a, a healthy user. So... Achieving certain goals is key, um, either individually or competitively, and that becomes very much a, a justification for what they're sharing and when they're sharing it, particularly for those training towards specific goals. And particularly what will be demonstrated in a quote, I'm just going to play at the end, the frustrations of the real or offline world um, tends to produce very emotionally embodied responses for users. So if data is lost or incorrectly captured, that's a real concern. And at times, um, faulty devices and inaccurate data can actually work in favour of these idealised representations. So many of the users actually spoke about how the device had incorrectly captured or, or sped up their run. And they had a, a positive idealised representation that wasn't true to what they'd actually done, but it was a better data for them. So they were happy that it was incorrectly captured and they could share it online and, and say that they'd done a run in, in a quicker time than they had before. So... Data capture, however inaccurate, holds gratifying significance over the reality of physical improvements through this quantified feedback on Facebook and Instagram. And that often comes in the form of likes. And so likes, as many of the participants recognise, becomes a form of currency. Um, one of my participants outlined that if I only got one like on a picture, I would think, oh, is something not working? I know it's really shallow. So they assume they're going to get likes, and if the likes aren't received, it's often the technology that's actually blamed, rather than perhaps the community wasn't interested or, or didn't want to like their, like their image. So the technological quantification is the condition from which social and positive health status is determined within these networks. So to conclude, social media can function as a social venue to represent self-tracking practices. The health self-representation is carefully constructed under the consciousness of peer surveillance and the imagined, at times, observation from others within social media. And these constructions are arguably only enabled and achieved through a highly reflexive individual who is continually reflexive on and offline. And these representations of a health self online and self-tracking behaviours offline is very interdependent process and, and health becomes very collaborative from the feedback from the community. So the health itself is achieved through, for and with help from the community. And the surveillance of and by others does influence the self-tracking users' practices of self-presentation. Good health is embodied through representation of data, often over personal gratification, and regardless of the actual individual improvements they actually make. Um, and the information produced through these devices, it changes users' behaviour and it changes our understanding of what we see as a body and also what we see as healthy, which is reinforced through through the social media community. And just to finish up, before I show you just a very short clip, um, all bodies don't operate, develop or optimise in the same way. We've discussed this this week, and this one-size-fits-all model and discourse of both self-tracking users and health identities needs to be given ongoing attention um, in consideration to these effects upon health management and physical pressure through these inherent self-policing and regulatory politics of self-tracking and the sharing of data. And I'm just going to finish up by 
providing a very short clip from this film. Because of sharing, you've got to get a certain time. And obviously you want to get a good time in the marathon, but you'd be stopping at a road because there's traffic. You'd be stressing out because it's going to affect your time. So you'd be thinking you've got to run this last bit faster because of the time. You still knew you run well. You know that on the day there won't be traffic, but you just get obsessed with posting it. Just acquisition of data doesn't necessarily mean better health outcomes. And we have to ask, what is all of this data doing for our bodies? Is it actually telling us anything more about our bodies than we already know? Thank you for your attention. Oh, hi, um, I'm Donnell Holloway from Edith Cowan University in Perth, Australia. And this um, presentation has been put together by myself and Giovanna Mascaroni from um, Catholic University in Milano and Simone Inglis also from Edith Cowan University. But I'm the only one here. So we're talking about um, quantified babies. Um, and the notion of a quantified baby stems from the use of devices that monitor and records uh, usually babies' biometric data, uh, usually via uh, wearable sensors nowadays, um, which detect and then automatically enter data. Examples include um, smart uh, diapers, which alert parents when their baby's diaper is wet, and uh, sleep monitors in the form of anklets and socks, that capture the sleep patterns of babies or their oxygen levels, mm. and teddy bears that track body temperatures. There's, there's quite a list uh, coming out at the moment. Uh, so, but for this study, um, we used a discourse analysis approach to examine commercial and other public available discourses uh, concerning baby wearables. We found that ads and infomercials about baby wearables tended to use a discourse of risk to heighten parental anxiety or blame over their baby's health and well-being. These discourses of risks position parents as having sole responsibility for their baby's health, safety and development and create a discursive, or they also create a discursive breach between goods that were previously only used in the healthcare system and everyday parenting practices. And these discursive, these commercial discourses usually frame and position the use of um, digital technology to to datafy babies' bodies as a virtuous parental practice that keeps babies safe and gives parents peace of mind. Um, this neoliberal responsabilisation um, sits alongside some other contradictory yet marginal discourses that we found in public commentaries um, that show concern about the quality of the parent-child relationships when mediated by wearables and apps and the implications for um, the physical safety of babies because of the use of Bluetooth and Wi-Fi um, from such a very near their bodies from such a very early age, and also children's privacy rights and data security. There's something else we found as we're going through them um, and we're thinking about the ads. We also found that some of the ads and commentaries are reflecting, to some degree, um, Van Noonan's notion of eye epistemology, uh, which can be described as a. I'm from a cultural studies. Um, discipline. So it's a contemporary cultural process in which people from all walks of life have come to suspe suspect the knowledge coming from official institutions and experts and politicians um, and have replaced it to some degree with knowledge gained by personal experience um, and turning that into a more relevant truth. <coughs> so in the case of baby wearables in these ads, um, the data obtained from babies' bodies is seen in the ads um, as highly reliable and truthful sources of knowledge for parents and one which we replace as more personal embodied in intera interactions with the baby and parent. Okay. Hospital-based digital surveillance devices that monitor newborn babies' health and well-being are now making their way into the family home. Startup companies are developing health tracking devices intended to alleviate parental fears about their babies uh, especially while their babies are sleeping. These concerns, however, there are concerns, however, that these monitoring devices will heighten parent anxiety around their baby's health and well-being, and not normalise these fears. There's also um, some concern about 
um, the increased parental accountability um, these apps um, may develop. So the data produced from babies' bodies via these monitors mobilise the parents and carers into action. They are alerted to deviations in babies' um, physiologic data so that they can intervene often to, to provide urgent care. So the domestication of these technologies turns parental surveillance of their babies' bodies into a new parenting practice to cope with and utilise these technologies. And they extend the manner and mode of parental responsabilisation into new digital spaces, where previously it was face-to-face, -face, and tend to normalise these digital caring practices. And the use of these devices in uh, everyday life also opens up questions about who gets to be a knowledge producer and who actually owns that knowledge as well. So we analysed, um, we did look at a lot, but we analysed um, 15 video ads and 19 commentaries we, we found about baby wearables for the project. Um, and we were conscious of the interpretive scope of uh, media text, but what we did was analyse for the main meanings that advertisers were most likely to ascribe the product they are promoting. So the neoliberal idea usually locates healthcare within its market discourse. Thus, citizens in this sense are viewed as consumers of healthcare with an emphasis now placed on individual responsibilities as opposed to healthcare rights with little distinction between our roles as consumers and citizens. Uh, hence, as I mentioned before, before the, um, the texts we analysed um, tended to be consistent with risk and responsabilisation and stuff. For parents, this responsabilisation extends to their children as a responsabilisation of the self for others or being intimate for others. So that, then parenting then becomes a risky enterprise where children's health and well-being is a result of individual choices on the part of parents. In practice, this responsabilisation tends to be highly gendered, with mothers generally held more accountable for their children's health and development. And at the same time, however, um, parents are often positioned as inadequate managers um, within the context of these discussions of their parents' health and development and in need of expert advice or guidance. So I'm just going to show you one of, oops, the ads. This is um, this is one's a bit extreme, but it's fairly typical of. Oops, how do I go back? Oh, there it is. It had been about a week and we were sleeping, it was the middle of the night and I put the outlet on her. About two in the morning, it started flashing red. I ran over there and unswaddled her. She was choking and she was blue around her mouth and nose. I pat her back and turn her upside down until it comes up. I woke up to the outlet alarm going off. He had formula coming all stuck in his nose and it was coming out the side of his mouth. I run and I get the nasal aspirator. I suck out his nose and he just lets out this scream. We have been using the outlet for a couple months when one night it went off. I turned the lights on and noticed that he was blue around the mouth. I immediately stimulated him and he started breathing again. Introducing Outlet, the only monitor that is truly designed to alert you if your baby stops breathing. Unlike any other monitor on the market, Outlet uses the hospital technology of pulse oximetry. You may know it as the little red light that they clip on your finger when you go into the hospital. Pulse lock symmetry has been around for more than 40 years. It's safe, it's proven, and it's used in just about every hospital on earth. We miniaturized this technology, made it more appropriate for the home, and put it into a little baby booty that grows with your child. Just before your baby goes to sleep, put the smart sock on your baby's foot, and the base station will be up all night so you don't have to be. It really is that simple. Well, actually, it's a little more complicated than that. But don't worry, we've got you taken care of. In fact, Outlet is a collaborator on a $1.5 million grant from the National Institute of Health and working with a handful of hospitals and universities to further infant research. As parents ourselves, we built Outlet to give you one less thing to worry about. 
We knew Outlet had to be reliable, so we created a base station to act as your primary connection to alert you with lights and sounds. For added convenience, you can get alerts and see your baby's vital signs in real time right on your smartphone. What if you lose your phone or your home Wi-Fi cuts out? Don't worry, the base station is still your primary alert system. We spent two years developing the Outlet Monitor because we knew it had to not just be good, it had to be amazing. Yeah, and it is. <laughs> I had a video monitor, and unfortunately, it doesn't work unless I'm staring at it. With the Owlette, I have one less thing that I have to look at. I don't have to look at the monitor to know that it's working. You're nervous, and you're tired, and your emotions are crazy, and you're hormonal, and it's just peace of mind. I can rest, and I can be calm, and it, it's going to wake me up. To be able to, to sleep at night and knowing that your child will be okay. You can't put a price tag on something like that. I don't know what would have happened if I didn't have the outlet. If the outlet didn't wake me up, I, I have no idea what would have happened that night. I'm just so thankful that I had an outlet. So um, when we were looking at, at this particular ad, um, it seemed like the use of the documentary style gave it more um, authority um, and the calming male voiceover, the usual one that we get in technology shots, um, had some gendered uh, discourse in it. The ad tended to instil fear and then knowledge and trust in the outlet technology. The what-if scenarios render the parents powerless unless they um, monitor their sleeping babies with one of these technologies. So we found that there was a risk and responsibilisation discourse. Mothers who use the outlet are responsible mothers who can save their babies' lives. Um, there was a medical discourse as the sense of authority. There was a strong reference to medical technology within this um, ad that eliminates the risk of SIDS. And an obvious gendered discourse with the mothers um, powerless, a male voiceover and the two male developers offering rational, reliable, technology-based solutions to the mother's worst nightmare. So, I oh, won't do that one, I'm going to run out of time. Um, I was going to show you an another ad which is quite different, um, but before that I'll just go through Van Zunen's so she, I, I, epi, epistemology. She suggests that there's a contemporary cultural process, um, I, pos, I epistemology, in which expert knowledge is often discredited and dismissed in favour of personal experiences as the privileged source of knowledge. So in this sense, and what we found in some of the ads, baby wearable, wearables promise to turn parents into experts, or at least into the source and repository of truth regarding their babies. From this point of view, baby wearables can be viewed as an externalised form of embodiment that pa distances parents from more subjective embodied interactions with their babies. In other words, parents embodied in interactions with their babies, such as listening, watching, touching their babies, are being re replaced by um, data to some extent. In this sense also, some discourses around baby wearables can be seen to employ this eye epistemi epistemology discourse and the truth about babies lies in the knowledge that is stored in the data. Vanzuna writes that there is simultaneous assumption that the truth is in there, in the self, or in this case in the self's baby, and baby wearables provide parents with true knowledge, not subjective embodied judgments that can be deceptive or unreliable. Baby wearables datify babies' bodies with the promise of turning parents into exports, experts. So while the practices and discourses associated with baby wearables can be seen to draw on discourses associated with individualism or neoliberalist privileging of self-responsibility, they can also seem to intersect with Van Zunen's epistemology, where the self or the self's baby, facilitated by digital technologies and data generation, turns into a source of truth or knowledge and agency. So, um, here we go. This one's about uh, another monitor call, uh, called a Sproutling, which is 
worn around the ankle of the baby. It monitors the baby and the environment. It also learns and predicts the baby's sleep patterns. It measures heart rate, skin temper temperature, motion and the baby's position. So it sends data to an application on the phone, um, letting parents know if the child is sleeping soundly. So I'll just, this video seems to rely more on um, an epistemology sort of outlook. To show you. This is you. This is your baby. You are a fully formed, even dare we say skilled, human being. Your baby isn't. You've matched belts with shoes, gotten to work on time at least 83% of the time, and emerged from the human mating ritual with someone you actually love. To be honest, your baby hasn't really done anything that impressive, yet. So why are you so afraid of your baby? Look, you've got this. Sure, sleep is like maybe not ever happening again. You're wiping things you never thought you'd wipe off another human being. And it's not exactly like your love life is firing in all cylinders these days. Maybe all you need is a little help. This is a job you not only can do, but can own with the help of the Sproutling Baby Monitor. It works with your phone. So say your baby is sleeping and you just want to know if his tiny little heart is beating. It's perfectly normal, you're a parent. Well, we can help with that. Or you'd like to know if he's happy or cranky when he gets up. You got it. Maybe you're doing something insane like socializing and you just want to know if it's getting a little loud in the baby's room. It can actually do that. Or you'd like to have an idea of when he's gonna wake up so you can say, get reacquainted with the person you used to know before all of this? Yep, done. You can even charge it on 0.0, .0 hours of sleep. These are just little things, but they can help you a ton. Be confident. Be strong. Be a life-living, sleep-having, Baby raising badass. So, uh, when we sort of had a look at this, it's, it's sort of humorous um, sort of narrative with a 20, 30 something hipster couple. Um, and what was interesting is the parents only look momentarily concerned a few seconds when the music stopped when they're looking over the cot and that was the only sort of reference to much um, concern or, or risk. It was directed at something else. Um, the couple are depicted as in control but wishing to get back their old um, pre-baby life back. So the Sproutling will help them um, do this. So the types of discourses, there wasn't much of a risk and responsibilisation discourse and there was little or no reference to a medical discourse or a medical authority within this um, ad. Um, we're still trying to work out what the gender discourse was. There is something in there, but um, I'll work on that. But we seem to think there's a definitely an epistemology discourse where the baby wearables have a promise of turning parents into experts or baby raising badasses. In the, in the sense that um, the advertisement people sort of tried to, we're thinking, tried to use an epistemology mindset in the ad. They had less reference or no reference to expert knowledge and more reference to the self or the parent in giving them a sense of agency and a sense of expertness. Um, and, and the product will um, help them do that. So we also looked at um, public commentary, um, and this is hard to show here, but overall we found that um, compared to commercials, commentaries offered a more diverse spectrum of discourses around baby wearables and tracking, though the, still there was the, the discourse of risk and responsabilisation running through many of the com commentaries and that remained relatively central in the um, public commentaries. Um, 
that, that discourse of risk um, especially dominates those articles posted in tech blogs and in the form of listicles or product reviews of top selling uh, tracking wearables for infancy. They adopt a language of emotions and exploit parent anxieties. In this way, um, babies tracking is constructed as a form of good parenting. Listicles and tech blogs also construct parenthood as, and the child as a consumable uh, and everyday activity for which, as with e other everyday activities and tasks, appropriate technologies and apps are available that make things um, easier. On, on the other hand, newspaper articles or articles in magazines um, were more likely to give voice to dissonant, dissonant perspectives on, the, on baby wearables, which question the efficacy of wearable devices from both the viewpoint of health professionals and parents. And journalists um, sometimes reiterated these critiques as parents themselves. Um, the, this is just one of the um, commentaries we analysed. Um, it was a blog post uh, that introduced a list of top selling wearables and smart devices. So the narrative within this um, text um, revolved around the idea that parenthood was a daunting task, that technology can alleviate um, by assisting parents in keeping their children safe and healthy, it, and it sells the idea that smart devices, wearables offer you peace of mind. So generally speaking, and because it, this text was um, longer, um, written text, there were, we noticed all the discourses um, having quite a dominant position, the, the risk and responsabilisation, the medical discourses were referred to as well. And um, there was also an epistemology discourse where parents are promised to be turned into experts um, the, and the tech supported knowledge is more reliable than experiential embodied knowledge or medical knowledge. Okay, so um, just to conclude, our analysis found that baby wearables rely heavily on a risk and responsabilisation discourse where parental anxiety is normalised and where medical authority associated with medical grade monitors is used to persuade and influence parents that these monitors are safe and reliable technologies to use. Um, the discourses embedded within, within the ads were often highly gendered where women um, are positioned as accountable for their baby's health and well-being and reliant on these technologies to alleviate their fears and anxieties. Alongside this, um, the commercial discourses, um, there were the counter-narratives um, in magazines and news articles that dispute the necessity of baby wearables <coughs> and, comment, and also comment on the emotional distancing that wearable and apps may have on the parent-child relationship, as well as the implications of um, children's privacy and data safety. And we are finding that the, the d parents' desire to be authoritative sources of information about their babies um, um, or an epistemology discourse has been incorporated into some of the ads and commentaries we analysed, with baby bearer wearables being promoted as an aid or tool to which parents can become ex experts or um, baby raising um, badasses in their baby's health and well-being. Thank you. So I've kind of written and rewritten this talk a couple of times over the last few days um, and I'll sort of pre-warn you that this is going to be a fairly loose um, and open talk and that's for two reasons. The first of those is that um, during the conference um, sometime earlier this morning I think I wrote the last three sentences of my PhD um, which I've been working on for about five and a half almost six years now. Um, and the other one of those um, reasons is jet lag um, and the kind of jet lag that only Australians can lay claim to. Um, so I I'm going to try and stay kind of coherent, but um, by nature, um, this is a fairly kind of loose talk um, and it's full of a whole bunch of provocations. Um, so I've called this talk anticipatory methodology um, and I kind of mean anticipation in a couple of different ways. Um, the first of those is um, by sort of doing a PhD part-time um, with this type of technology at the sort of centre of it, um, one of the things that's happened over the course of the research is the kind of technology has moved, the, the, the type of stuff um, that happens around the technology is sort of being in, in, in motion. 
Um, and that's a really frustrating thing if you're trying to kind of lock down an object of analysis. Um, so one of the things that I've had to sort of develop um, as a thinking instrument is a way to kind of work outside that and a way to sort of think and anticipate what might happen with these technologies. Um, and then how far you can take that thinking. How speculative can we be about these types of technologies? Um, the other meaning of anticipatory in this um, is about thinking about the afterlife of a PhD and thinking about what do you do next um, and how do you form a research agenda on the basis of, of, of a PhD around self-tracking technology. Um, so the kind of anticipatory aspect um, in that sense is thinking about what do you do <laughs> with all this stuff? Because um, you produce this thesis, this sort of you know, 80 to 100,000 word thing, but there's all this other stuff <laughs> that you have. There's this like file of all these other documents and all these YouTube clips and um, all these weird interviews and all these instruction manuals and all this stuff that, that you have that's just sitting there um, that's sort of paratextual, you know, it's outside of your thesis. Um, so what do you do with all that stuff? And for me, the kind of next move um, is to think about how can I put that material um, to good use? How do I do things sort of outside the, the body of the thesis with a lot of the work that scaffolded and supported the thesis itself? Um, so I'm not here to talk about my thesis. I'm here to talk about everything that sort of happens around it <laughs> um, and, and, and thinking sort of methodologically. And I'm just going to follow one of the kind of methodological lines um, that runs through my, my thesis, not a standalone anticipatory methodology, but more a set of provocations around that. Um, so I wanted to put this up just to kind of foreground a, a tension um, that I'm sure many of you um, can appreciate. Um, this is a, a quote from Evgeny Morozov, um, who most of you probably know, that, talking about self-tracking. And the reason I wanted to put this up here um, was because it's an incredibly frustrating <laughs> and problematic quote. I mean, if anyone's tweeting this, I'm probably about to get in a fight with him. Um, but, uh, um, but it's kind of true as well. But to me, it's kind of a naive critique. And it's something that I've kind of taken um, in my research to work out a way to kind of find a pragmatic critique that opposes this type of thinking around technology, this oppositional thinking of self-tracking versus a kind of more pragmatic critique um, that takes into account different types of applications and different types of knowledges around these technologies, different perspectives on them. Um, so how do we be critical of these technologies without being oppositional, being too down about the technology? Like it's always good to go after sort of positivist accounts of any type of, uh, of technology with a kind of political economy in mind, but how do we sort of make that pragmatic? How do we sort of align that to all those other kind of objectives we have in research, like around translational outcomes and partnerships with industry and all those types of things that we get sort of measured on ourselves as you know, academics within a kind of academic metric culture? Um, so I. Like all things, I'm probably like showing a kind of generational thing and a disciplinary thing. Um, I'm, a, I'm an STS person and I'm really into 90s STS, right? Um, so Langdon winner. Um, and, and, and this is the kind of thing I have stuck to my desk um, that kind of reminds me why I do this. Um, and this is uh, a quote that I really like to use, and that's, um, to achieve a political understanding of technology requires that we examine the realm of tools and instruments from a fresh perspective. And that's what I'm kind of trying to, to do here with my work. Um, so if the quote I showed you on the last slide, um, I used to sort of inspire people, and I use it with my students quite a lot when we're sort of thinking about the political economy of technology. Um, this is what I used to scare people. Um, and this is a diagram that I drew um, when I was feeling sort of fairly blocked in the middle of my PhD, just trying to kind of sort out, like, what is it that I'm actually doing? Like, what am I trying to achieve? What's all this stuff that's going on? And how am I going to get a thesis out of this? Because I'm just hitting all these weird dead ends. I'm finding really interesting examples, and then they're being sort of commercialized or diverted. So one of the things I look at in my work is something called prana, um, which was a technology designed for posture and breath tracking. Um, which then got picked up for um, managing pulmonary disease and a whole bunch of other applications. I mean, the object is kind of constantly moving. You've got to sort of keep incorporating those 
movements into, into the work. When do you actually stop? And that was a real problem for me. Um, so this is sort of something I drew out just to sort of think about what I was doing and trying to find a, a way forward. And I'll just talk you through this. This is just basically the sort of inner workings of, of my own thinking around my PhD. Um, so we kind of start with two different perspectives that are kind of, they come together, but they sort of also cycle and modulate. Um, and that is a sort of textual perspective on technology or a data perspective, you know, the sort of objects that the devices create, um, and a kind of cultural perspective. And we sort of know, you know, the sort of social, soci socio-materiality teaches us that we take these two things together, they're co-constitutive. So in the sort of coming together, do we think about that as convergence or modulation? Is it coming together or is there this sort of evolving mutual constitutive nature of the kind of textual thing, the thing that, that exists around the technology, the thing that the technology produces, and the cultural perspective on these technologies? How do people use it? How do we observe them? What are the idiosyncratic behaviours that arise around these types of technologies and so on? And um, So... I'm not an ethnographer. I think I've said that in every single talk I've ever done. Um, I, I'm not an ethnographer. I don't do participant observation. That's not sort of the type of work that I do. Um, but I like to kind of think of myself as someone who extends work that's happening in the field of media archaeology and looking at the sort of media about media, the documentation. And we've seen a lot of that in the last two talks. So um, I think I'm on the right panel, um, which isn't often the case. So in arraying these sort of objects, this media about media, um, we can think of devices themselves, documentation of, of practices and experiences and so on. Um, we can think of documentation as sort of theoretical constructs and the things that we read um, and the things that we read about and, and the things that other people do that we read um, as, as sort of academic discourses. I think about documentation of social histories and memory around these types of technology. Um, thinking outside the kind of frame of reference that begins in 2007 when Kevin Kelly and Gary Wolf sort of said, here's the, here's the quantified self. Um, and then thinking about the sort of consumption-oriented meaning generation that comes out of all this stuff. So how do companies like Fitbit or Garmin or Jawbone, I should, I should never, Talk. I should never mention names, but I always do. Um, how, do how do they create meaning? So looking at things like advertising, for example, which we saw in the last talk. Um, and then looking at culturally oriented understandings of the utility of these technologies. What are they good for? What do they do? How do they help us? How do they maybe not help us? Um, and then trying to establish relationships between these sort of different modes of, of usage that happen in different sort of spaces, everything from sort of hacker spaces and meetups through to workplaces where you've got a workplace challenge that you've got to take 10,000 steps or drink the most water or whatever it might be. And taking these different modes of interaction and establishing relationships between these sort of modalities of, of use um, and objects, objects that we can pick up and study. Um, and I'll try to sort of take all of this um, and formulate a theory about human agency that kind of flows through this type of technology. Um, so again, continuing my 90s, so, um, 90s STS um, theme, I, I'm kind of thinking a little bit about um, Bruno Latour and his book, Science in Action. And I'm going to wake up my computer here, which has gone to sleep, because I'm going to interrupt myself by reading some things in a minute. Um, so I'm thinking about this sort of the opening of, of Latour's Science in Action. Um, and to my mind, one of the most sort of recurrent tropes in both mainstream and academic discourses on self-tracking um, is that it's a participatory citizen-led project. Right? Um, and the sort of predominant site of epistemological production um, is motivated and incentivized um, or forced at the sort of level of, of individuals, self-experimenters, citizen scientists, and so on. Um, so in thinking about 
this this kind of Janus faces or two-faced idea um, of contemporary evidence-based scientific thought um, shows us that on the left side you've got sort of data garnering technologies um, that are sort of pre-configured and ready-made. Um, and here we kind of see the sort of idea of hope. Right? Here are these technologies that we have and we can use them to solve certain problems. And this is sort of where that kind of positivistic optimism comes from. Um, and then on the other side, we've got this sort of more loose, open science in making the sort of fashioning of tools. And this is the kind of meetup space idea of self-tracking technology. Um, and it's here where the sort of notion of prediction, the study of prediction, how do we sort of predict what happens with these types of technologies? And how do we understand how the industrial side of this might impact the more open sort of hacker oriented or creative use of these types of technologies. Um, so as Andreas reminded us on Wednesday, it was Wednesday, I think, um, contemporary self-tracking is marked by three distinct temporal phases. The kind of first anchoring, defining and framing phase, then this sort of community formation phase, and then this sort of institutionalization, prototyping, and kind of becoming industrious phase. And I think my research has kind of spanned all three of these, um, which I'd like to think is a deliberate strategy, um, but it's just that I don't have a PhD scholarship and I have to work full time to fund myself. And that's basically why I'm sort of working across a slightly larger time scale, um, which spans all of those things. So, um, what I'm kind of concerned with around this sort of idea of the, the time frames is that there are forces um, of radical agency granting production at play um, in this evolution, but also forces of recuperation and industrial absorption and abstraction of power, which suppress the kind of emancipatory potentials on which this whole project of self-quantification and self-tracking in the kind of contemporary sense is based on. Um, so the first sort of step um, I take in declaring my kind of second theoretical inclination, which is a, as a media theorist, um, is to think about this through a critique of novelty. You know, are these technologies new media? Are they new in some way? Um, and what you're seeing there is three um, diagrams which are taken from patent documentation. Um, the one on the far left there is um, a galvanic um, skin response wearable device patented in 1975. Um, the one in the middle is just a contemporary Fitbit Force, I think. Um, and then that one on the end there um, is from, I think, the late 80s or early 90s, and that's a house arrest bracelet. Um, I'm managing to connect these types of technologies, and you'll see how sort of far this goes in a moment, um, just by using patent documentation and following the prior art citations. And I can go from a Fitbit back through house arrest bracelets to weird galvanic skin devices from the 70s that were, that were meant to measure mood and fitness and well-being. Um, so this kind of critique of novelty is also based around the idea of technological framing. That um, working within a kind of frame of techno-social practices that will tend towards stability um, and fixity in terms of the patterns that happen around these types of technologies. And people that, are that have high inclusion rates in this sort of technological framing, um, be it sort of active members of the quantified self or the type of figures um, that we hear that are sort of keeping that discourse together around the sort of QS um, label may not have the kind of thinking present to be able to generate sufficient critical distance on understanding how those technologies evolve. Um, and the kind of first provocation I have is that that inclusion in that technical frame might include us as academics working in this field. Um, and there's a kind of constant reminder that we also create our own technological frames <laughs> and then we support them <laughs> and we perpetuate them and they become fixed and rigid and hard and ossified, right? 
Um, so with this in mind, I'm kind of briefly um, going to spend the remainder of, of my talk talking about some of the, um, some of the practices um, that I've developed through my work on sort of trying to achieve this critical distance. So the first of these um, is just looking at archival practices and life logging practices um, and looking at this um, through people like George Perec, um, who logged all the food he consumed in the year 1974 or whenever it was in, in, in that book. Um, Buckminster Fuller, who documented his entire life in the thing called the Dymaxion Chronophile. Um, and then Eric Ikurunemi, who um, produced massive digital archives with this sort of idea that, you know, quantum computing available in the year 2048 will just help us make, make sense of it all at some point in the future. Um, so Fuller's looking at, hey, people want to understand my philosophy, they can go to my archive. Perec's sort of looking at this different sort of information taxonomy idea, and um, Kurunemi's sort of looking at this sort of forward-facing idea that computers in the future might help us um, understand all this data. And these are themes, I think, that, that kind of fit um, quite well with um, studies of the quantified self. Um, I'm going to skip over that, um, probably because I'm citing myself, and that's kind of weird. But um, the other sort of idea is around affordance and around the sort of lateral transfer of affordances, not thinking about the technology in generations, but thinking that the technology is more open. And I'm sort of motivated here by um, some work that Belinda Barnett did, um, looking at Niels Eldridge, who studied this instrument, the cornet, um, and sort of looked at that as a sort of taxonomic evolutionary thing, looking at how the different features of this instrument um, have evolved across different types um, of, of examples of, of those cornets, which is um, great if you've got loads of money and you can have the largest archive of cornets, but maybe one day someone will have the largest archive of fitness tracking devices that we can all draw from. Um, again, this is just some of the data that came through patents. This is the range um, of different types of self-quantification technologies that I was able to find by spending 45 minutes just looking through prior art citations in um, in Google Patents. Um, and all of those devices or all of those technologies there are linked somehow through documentation. Um, so these three different kind of modalities that I've talked about um, suggest that the hackerspaces and the, the meetups to this sort of solution seeking community to this sort of end use and ultimate use communities are they kind of fold back on one another. We can't like make those separations. And, and there's an important distinction there between end use and ultimate use. So is the person doing the tracking the end user or what are the kind of ultimate uses and how far does that go? How far does that go in time? You know, do we have that sort of Kurunemi like 2048 idea um, when we think about the privacy issues around self-tracking data or the repurposing of self-tracking data? Um, so here's some examples of some of the documents that I'm using some of the key generative documents. Um, GitHub, uh, GitHub libraries, um, what you're seeing there is a Reddit AMA and Ask Me Anything, that's the one with Kevin Kelly um, that I've been using and some of the discourses in that are really interesting in developing kind of thinking and critical thinking around this stuff. Um, that's the Fitterbase Research Library, that's a library of all the um, studies or as many studies as could be found um, that use a Fitbit in them. Um, and that's uh, just a position description around a wellness program manager. We heard a little bit about that earlier in the week. Um, and those are the kinds of documents that have sort of sat around my thesis um, that I think are really useful in developing sort of critical perspectives. Um, having said that, the sort of last thing I'll talk about um, is the Fabric of Digital Life Archive, which Andrew Eliadis and Isabel um, Peterson um, have developed out of the University of Ant Ontario. And this is a really interesting archive of wearable technology that looks at things like the different human-computer interaction platform, the different discursive type. Is this marketing material? Is it an academic article? Is it a YouTube video? Um, the persuasive type is it academic? Is it advertisement? An art project? Is it an information thing? What kind of media is it? Um, what's a theme? Um, what kind of location on the body? And that goes right through. Um, what is it augmenting? Um, and what kind of companies and individuals are being featured in that? So um, the one that you're seeing there is around workplace sociality and well-being, and that's um, where I have donated a lot of the kind of material that I have in my work, um, and I'm doing that with every chapter in my thesis, all that sort of paratextual material I'm donating into this archive. So this one's on workplace well-being initiatives. Um, the other one I'm doing is around um, seizure tracking, 
technology um, and so on. And that's me a little bit over time, but thank you. Um, questions or comments people would like to make? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for someone. Um, the acts of the methodology and the critique of novelty, you know, how do they exactly tie to, together? Uh, is it, are you doing some sort of trajectories that are then kind of uh, going to the future as well? Or is it, what is the anticipatory element here? Yeah, I think we're all, I think there's a couple of different ways the, the, the sort of method becomes anticipatory and if we think about like the kind of trajectory for, to my mind it's um, so the sort of critique of novelty and thinking speculatively about technology and te technological affordances um, for me has meant um, I find as someone in the humanities and social sciences that I get roped into lots of different research projects around self-tracking as the kind of token critical humanities social person um, and I think that, you know, for, for most of us working in the humanities and social sciences, there's this kind of arrogance that we have, which is, you know, justified and, and earned um, around that our idea of social um, subordinates other understandings of, of that. And I think the sort of predictive aspect of that is it allows me to sort of be on, uh, on projects that are looking at developing um, proprietary wearable technology or purpose-built wearable technology um, around, um, say, health, for example, um, and looking at things like tamper-proofing, um, which, you know, get talked about around the table as like, hey, that's just like a really great thing, right? Let's, let's just whack in tamper-proofing. Um, and then some of the work I've done around house arrest bracelets has showed how tamper-proofing works and whether tamper-proofing does work, um, as well as, you know, people who make decisions about that type of technology um, would, would assume. Um, and that, that's meant that, you know, I've spent time in, in research meetings where I've just gone onto YouTube and said, show, you know, 50 videos. And they're like, here's how people mess with tamper-proofing, right? Is this really a good idea? Is this something that we can think about? But I think there will be, you know, in the future, um, Fitbits or probably or in development that will have tamper-proofing mechanisms in them or sweat sampling um, for sobriety and all sorts of other reasons. Or, you know, drugs in sport is the other big one. Um, so yeah, I think that's sort of where that sort of anticipatory mm -hmm. aspect of it gets put into play and it sort of translates into value that can be sort of pulled back into transdisciplinary research. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a, perhaps a question, perhaps a comment for you, Rachel. Uh, with, I, I very much enjoyed your presentation because part of it actually it's very similar to some writing I've been sitting doing myself, uh, trying to connect with the use of self-tracking and, and uh, social network media. And um, the, your presentation made me think about uh, how the, that, the, the fact that you make a user study, how that ties with the neoliberal framework. Because perhaps I'm not, I'm not the very theoretical, well-oriented kind of, of scholar, but, but as far as I know of, the neoliberal way of thinking is a very deterministic, uh, uh, top-down approach. And somehow I, I see there might be, be some, some, some aspects in your data from your interviews with people that uh, might be, be better interpreted by using uh, Ulrich Beck's concept about in individualization, Barry Wellman, about networked individualism, etc. So I was just wondering whether you have been, 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 been around some of these other uh, scholars. Yeah, I have, yeah, and I don't, um, I hope it doesn't come across that I'm kind of celebrating these technologies too much, I'm definitely not, or that I assume that my participants are just very passively kind of using and sharing and it's a very utopian space, that's, that's definitely not my perspective, um, that was just the focus for this, for this paper and that chapter, but... Um, but they are quite resistant in some spaces and there's this kind of rise of the demonised self as well on social media and, and being kind of resistant to some of these kind of dominant discourses and, and I don't see all of them as just um, being adopting those kind of dominant neoliberal ideologies. I don't see that kind of all the way through it. Um, I suppose I see that as a wider systemic 
um, uh, rationalization that then is kind of in, um, advocated and encouraged um, through the technology, and it is adopted in certain ways and practices, um, not in every case. But, but you could also take a broader approach and, and see that what these technologies actually do is not that perhaps they just stimulate an orientation which is already there with the users. Yeah. Which could be like Ulrich Beck would say, well, these, these are individuals that are forced into uh, making themselves, creating themselves all the time, or uh, David Riesman's old book about the other directed person which is, it responds very well with what you said, these peers are very motivated by the fact that others have been seeing them. And I think that, that both Beck and, and uh, David Riesman's old work about the other directed person actually is, 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 is reflecting more precisely what is happening there than, than this, yeah. Then it, it's not just the technology, it's, it's, it might be there before the technology enters. No, I completely agree. Yeah. And I think, especially when I was looking at the self-surveying aspects of it, exactly. that's when you can really see those individualization discourses mm. that they're really apparent there. Mm. Um, however, the, I'm focusing on people that are sharing, so it is a collaborative space. It mm. is a space where um, there are other discourses at play. I can't just focus on this kind of individualization approach. Um, yeah, but no, thank you for your comment. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks uh, very much for some really interesting talks. Um, I have a uh, kind of a, an observation, perhaps about the first two. That uh, <coughs> what's interesting, we've had this discussion and uh, also the plenary uh, of the, um, the first session today with Roski um, about um, the culture shift. You know that it's it's a, it's a new phenomenon, and I think discourses um, help us see what's going on and perhaps explain a little bit um, how. Uh, the, the uptake is, is happening. Um, for example, the risk and responsabilization there um, is a very good example of that. Um, and I think as well with this, um, the likes and the voyeuristic gaze, I think that also explains a little bit the uptake that you described. Um, but um, I have a question now about the, the, sort of the, the darker side that you were talking about, the, sort of the, the lying and the cheating and, and that sort of thing. Uh, are there reflections on, on this element? Uh, yeah, uh, kind of professional, or we shouldn't be doing this. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, um, all the participants have been fantastically honest about, um, yeah, they're kind of lying to the machine, lying to themselves. Yeah. Um, but they, they kind of, they think that's okay because they want to have this idealized representation of the body or their data, um, and that's a part of the process. Um, and they all kind of giggle about it and kind mm. of think, oh, you know, I know I shouldn't be doing this or I shouldn't be kind of twisting or playing with the data. Mm. Um, but that doesn't, you know, they still, there's the data that they're focused on, the representation that they want. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That so is they, really fascinating. They are very reflective about it, but yeah, yeah that, the weight is, is in the data, mm -hmm. not on it being authentic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, just really a couple of comments. Um, so I just need to draw attention to this. I'm sure everyone in the room is thinking about this. Sunil, Donnell, the ankle, the house arrest bra uh, bracelet, and the baby thing. Well, yes. <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but I just I found it really interesting, um, you know, the kind of the uses or the oper operationalization of a uh, of shame and guilt, um, how these, you know, how these uh, kind of feelings of fear um, are mobilized in, in so many of these platforms and devices, um, and you know that's that's sort of a, a part of neoliberalism that we don't often talk about. I mean, Ross Gill has talked about it in her work on academic labor, for example, but. Uh, but it's you know almost as if we're so busy thinking about you know the compulsion to act, the compulsion to make a choice that that we sort of uh, ignore the that that emotional motivation or, or that that generative emotion that that makes us act, which is generally fear, guilt, shame, something along that, and your responsibility yeah. around that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so not a question. Just to follow up on that, when, when regards to what you said, I think that the guilt also, um, they feel quite guilty about, say for example, Sophie's uh, case where she's 
playing around with her food every night to make it look aesthetically pleasing for Instagram. And, and she, when I kind of, we probed a bit deeper on that on the interview. And um, yeah, she kind of recognized that um, it was a very addictive, habitual practice, but also one that she was quite ashamed of, mm -hmm. that she spent so much time and shame kept coming up. That was a dominant discourse around um, uh, how they how they felt about their practices. They were shameful about what they were doing online, but that didn't uh, didn't affect behaviour at all. Um, and so there was a kind of guilt of oh I know I shouldn't be I know it's a bit obsessive or it's a bit um, yeah I'm kind of getting too wrapped up in myself too narcissistic. But that didn't affect how they um, how they actually then carried on with their practices. Yeah, actually that, that, that just really made me think as well because of. There was kind of idealised representations in all of your papers. Obviously, people actively constructing and <coughs> curating these um, idealised representations in, in Rachel's work, and the idealised representations in, in the, uh, the commercials, um, which are, that, is that particularly kind of maybe 21st century kind of idealisation, where you, you um, show a little bit of kind of um, uh, a weak, or like uh, clumsy, or oh, knock, knock the bottle over, and this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I do like representations, which, which I, I always think are really kind of funny in the um, uh, the patterns um, with the people with the, uh, the kind of um, uh, like the, the, the faces like the people on the uh, insert you get on the back of a plane that tells you what to do. Yeah, the, uh, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, but I just wondered how the, 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 they're quite. The, the, the role of curation in that is kind of really interesting, in the way that people are curating in, in, in Rachel's, and, but you're engaging in the practice of curation. And I wonder if these kinds of technologies and um, in some kind of circular way are having some impact on what curation means. Like, curation is not something I know anything about, obviously, I don't imagine you do because you're curating things. Um, but, but you're both, for me, involved in curating your, um, your film and you talk about this yeah. process of curation. It, 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 are there changes in what that means because of these kinds of processes, do you think? Um, yeah, I, when I think, sorry, do you want to go? You yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, well, I just think that certainly in terms of, we were talking about trends last night at the dinner actually, mm. and about how it, I think there is a slight shift away from being an idealised perfect um, body or self towards um, yeah, trying to be authentic. Mm. So I think that in curation, if we think about curation with self-representation, I think it's about having yeah, little bits of uh, bad traits or vices mm. or that, that in, you know, unhealthy meal or, mm. or um, yeah, someone going out having a drink or you know, trying to contrast these very um, yeah, um, you know, perfect, idealised healthy bodies and beings and lifestyles. And there is a more of a shift to try and represent a healthy, authentic self as somebody who doesn't, you know, do that all the time. But, but in, with these participants in my work, they were often just taking pictures, I just mentioned it, they were often just taking pictures of other people's food because they still were completely obsessive, but they wanted to construct this balance, even though it wasn't actually their consumption habits or their lifestyle. So they were kind of, yeah. That seems very kind of like, yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah, fascinating kind of mix. What you were saying was just from reminding remind me of something I've just written about. Um, about uh, my, I wrote about um, the family photograph album and the, around curation and archiving of them with the, um, the real photograph album and then moving towards um, the digital um, on your computer files and now it's moving, um, I and a lot of people I know, most of their family photographs are on Facebook and they're relying on Facebook, they, they curate them there and they're also lazy and relying on Facebook to archive them for you, that you can always go back and, and get them. So just talking about technologies and archiving is an interesting notion. Were you going to say something about that? Um, I think from my sort of practice, the sort of act of curation is kind of half the time passive. In that I'm looking through patent documents mm -hmm. and I'm like quite constrained by the prior art citations or you know this sort of natural or almost natural relationships between different objects that aren't natural at all that, that sort of seem kind of weird and you're like wow those two things are, are related somehow that's, that's really weird um, and then this sort of you know the sort of flip side of that which is a sort of very active mode of, of curating together all these different technologies to kind of unframe or reframe the, the, the self-tracking device and I think that that's a sort of you know constant sort of dual 
practice of curation that's part of the research process. That sort of, you know, sometimes you do have to kind of just let yourself be a little bit more passive and use the natural relationship between things to kind of find those unnatural relationships. Um, it's not always as like, as, as, as convenient and straightforward as, hey, the house arrest bracelet and the, the, the baby's um, monitor are probably the only two examples we've seen um, of a wearable on the ankle. If we just look at, at the ankle as a site, they're the only two places. So what does that then say about the, the baby and the prisoner? Um, <laughs> that's right. And, 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 and do we ever like think about those two actors um, in the same idea? Well, they're both behind bars as well. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just add something very quickly? It's just to make me think also about creations on Instagram and, and the participants who are sharing food photography or food porn uh, would obviously have different coloured meals every night so that on Instagram you've got the three tiered and they would only do say like three dinners and then something else the next three and then three and then three so all of the albums were like that but it was very important that each night's dinner food colours were complementary to the previous photo and the photo thereafter but, so that, you know, but that's what they're eating every night as well. So the curation is online, but also in their bodies. You know, they're kind of really embodying what they're representing, which I just found fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, two comments on the quantified um, baby, and one just adds to what, what you mentioned. Uh, I was absolutely impressed by this vision of a deficient body, that the baby is really not a full person, that it's not perfect, that it's something you have to be, to, to, not, not to grow, but that's really born as something incomplete. And that was absolutely shocking, this vision of a body and a person which was given by the, by the ad, um, just for uh, the, the common. And then reflecting on some interviews we did with, did with baby tracking moms, um, what we found was that somehow the concern of the baby piled up with other concerns so then there was a concern of the baby, and then through tracking, it was not that the concerns were minimized, but that there were concerns on the technology. Does it work? How does it work? Uh, did I put it right? And so, so on. Exactly. And more, exactly, more exciting. And then the concerns on numbers. So is my baby right? Is this number the right one? Is this number the right one? Uh, are the hours it has left the right numbers of hours, what is the norm? So there were like more concerns piling up by baby tracking. Okay. And that, was, that was really a kind of vicious circle and at least most of the moms we interviewed at some point they stepped out because there was like uh, more, I've got this concern of the baby and all the other concerns, I can't deal with them anymore. Yeah, and that does. was really um, well the experience we have from the, the, the interviews we conducted there. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, people said it does heighten anxiety. Um, not only just getting it, but using it like that because then you get anxious about what the data actually means mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, and there was a uh, recently a paper come out about uh, I think it was about the islet sock somebody. Um, did you do the art itself? I <laughs> uh, was looking at um, mothers' use of the art itself and, and interviewing them and found that not only was the heightened anxiety, but of course less um, physical interaction with their um, children and a change in that sort of relationship with the child um, slightly. We, we don't know what long-term um, outcomes that, that may um, involve. And also, which was really interesting, um, changing the relationships with partners as well around the technology and that, around the anxiety and watching the baby as well. So um, it's a brand new area that's complicated, I think, and I don't necessarily think it is the, the peace of mind technology that these people are necessarily saying, saying that they are. So is there any other comments people would like to make? I've got one little ad I'd like to show that I missed out. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs>
I think this is the one I 